anybody spot the bald eagle yet? I'll know because everybody will not be looking at me if it happens. That, that, that happens sometimes out here. I'm like, what's going on behind me? It's like, yeah, there's, there's birds flying, there's bald eagles, Bigfoot like coming up and walking across the... <laughs> we got the camera rolling, so, you know, if, if that happens. Yeah, it's going to be a good day for everybody. Trust me. Lord, we thank you again for the beautiful day that you've given us, for the, the beautiful Savior that we celebrate today and the, the life for us, Lord. And we just pray that as we get into your word that you will show us what you have for us today, show us something useful, conform us more, Lord, in your image and less in ours. Uh, Lord, open our hands. Let our hands be open to you to, to take out what needs to go, to put in what needs to be there. And, and uh, we just look forward to that today. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So those of you that are around know that we don't do special Easter and Christmas messages usually because our uh, philosophy, mine is anyway, uh, is it your philosophy? I speak of we, all right, that uh, wherever you're at in the Bible, you're going to find Christmas and you're going to find Easter, and it's almost become a challenge now. You know, this last week, I'm like, should I do it? Should I just throw down an Easter message or should I just keep going and find the Easter? We're just going to keep going. But I'm going to surprise you guys one of these days. I'm going to do an Easter message or a Christmas message on Christmas or Easter. And and you're going to be like, oh, huh? Or the middle of summer. Yeah, 4th of July. Let's talk about Christmas. Actually, it kind of works. Independence Day. Uh-huh. Yes. So we are in the book of uh, 1 John chapter 3, if you want to follow along. 1 John chapter 3, that is all the way down toward the end. It's kind of hard to find. It's on page 2342. (laughs) And uh, last week, I just want to go back and read what we covered last week. First John chapter three, starting in verse 19. This is how we know that we belong to the truth and how we set at our hearts at rest in his presence. If our hearts condemn us, we know that God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. Dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God. That's what we did last week. Now, we learned how we can know that we belong to the truth and that our hearts can be at rest with God. And who doesn't want their hearts at rest, right? And uh, so John throws that down, and the message here that he gave us was a bit surprising in that nothing really depends on us with what follows there. Uh, if our hearts condemn us, which they do sometimes, I get, if you have a guilty conscience sometimes, you start looking back at things you, you may have done yesterday, a week ago, 20 years ago, and you feel a little guilty about that. You don't feel, like, well, how could God love me? You know, sometimes your heart condemns you, but God is bigger than our hearts. Now, Satan... The devil, Diabolos, we talked about that, is the accuser, and he likes to come along and and point the finger at us and help condemn us when we do wrong. We've, we've got something in our past, something in our hearts that makes us feel guilty. He likes to come and point the finger. Not so with God. He says, if, if our hearts condemn us, God is bigger than our hearts. God will overrule our hearts when he needs to overrule our hearts. I love that. And we watched uh, a movie Got home the other night, like, we're going to watch the Easter movie. The greatest story ever told. Haven't seen it since I was a little kid. And my mom used to put that one on once in a while. And, and I don't know how long that movie was. It was long, and it wasn't that great. <laughs> Something about a Swedish Jesus I was just really having trouble with. You know, John, this is how you should pray. He wasn't that bad, but, you know. He kind of honed his English accent, which was very important in the biblical movies, apparently. People back in this day spoke with an English accent, and, you know, that's how business got done. And uh, so here comes Jesus to get baptized. He's Swedish. He's got blue eyes, and he's got eyeliner on, which is kind of weird, just for that scene, not for the rest of it. Um, and, yeah, and maybe it washed it off. It washed the eyeliner away, you know. And so they left stuff out that should I thought should have been there. They got things kind of messed up, the, like, events. Like, Judas didn't hang himself. He, like, threw himself into the altar to burn. 
I thought that was kind of weird. I, mean, I didn't notice. I didn't know that when I was five or six years old. But the one thing I really liked was the portrayal of the enemy. Jesus goes up to get, get tempted, and there's this unassuming, kind of nice-looking older man sitting there. Just like everybody's grandpa. And he's sitting there, he's eating. He's like, I bet you're hungry, huh? Yeah, you turn these stones to bread, you know. And every he, like, pops up at different times in the film, and he's the accuser. He will lead people into doing something wrong and then point the finger at them. And that's not us. If our hearts condemn us, God is bigger than our hearts. He will overrule our hearts. We know we have passed from death to life, verse 14 said, because we love each other with a love inherited and a love learned from Jesus. Love that gives all when it gets nothing back. Agape love, that's that one of a kind, that Jesus love that gives everything even if it receives nothing. Love that just is. It can't be scared off, can't be cut off, can't be blown off. It just is. It's just there. So this is how we know we've inherited eternal life. We pass from death to life as if we have this love. We know this love. This love lives in us. This love starts to exude out of us. That's how we know. So if we don't feel lovely or lovable, God will overrule our hearts and our feelings because his love doesn't depend on how we feel. Is that good news? Some days I don't feel good. And if, if God's love depended on how I feel and my attitude, I, you know, I think it'd be like, time out, you go to the corner, you stand there till you get yourself straightened out. And you, you don't come out till I tell you, you know. But he doesn't do that. His love doesn't depend on how we feel. Our response to that love is on us. But his love is there. Can't be scared off, blown off, broken, sent away. Nothing. In a way, this complicates things for us. At least it does for me because I'm not in control of it. I can't start it. I can't stop it. I can't create it. I can't destroy it. There's nothing I can do to keep it from being, to make it, or to keep it from being. It's not on me. It kind of takes it all out of my hands. That's problematic for me. I like to be in control of my stuff, you know. So God's love is out of our control. God's love is out of control. Maybe that would be the message title today on, online. He loves us in spite of ourselves and because of ourselves. We talked last week uh, about the Antiques Roadshow. When, when the experts, they get, they get jittery. They see something that's just so cool. And you can tell their, their heart's racing. They're like, oh, my goodness, I've never seen one like this before. And that's what we are to God. And on the way home, Halanis told me, she says, you know, it kind of reminded me of that, I forget which toy story it was, but where Woody ends up, uh, he's not at home anymore, he ends up, he doesn't know where he's at, and he's in a, a toy shop, he's been picked up by a collector who takes him and sews him up and repaints stuff and, you know, sets him back the way he was, because this guy saw the value in this now old toy. And, you know, that's what we are to God, we're one of a kind, we're works of art, we're old old collectibles, you know, that, that he, he wants. He wants for himself, and he will restore us and, and put us back the way we should be, carefully and lovingly. And that's where, that's all last week. We could, we could like, pack that up, put that in our little bag of stuff to take away, and I feel like we're good today. Man, just rehashing what happened last week, that's good news. We're going to pick it up today. Let's read verse 21 again and go on. Dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God and receive from him anything we ask because we keep his commandments and do what pleases him. And this is his command, to believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another as he has commanded us. The one who keeps God's commands lives in him and he in them. And this is how we know that he lives in us. We know by the spirit he gave us. So we will receive from him whatever we ask. That's kind of weird for Easter. Hallelujah, he is risen. He is no longer in the grave, and now he's going to be Santa Claus. He's going to give us everything we ask for. No, it, it's, it doesn't mean that. All right. We will receive from him whatever we ask. This is not a blank check. And this came up when we studied through John. Because uh, this is you know, John didn't just make this up. Jesus said this, and it's in the Gospel of John, in chapter 15, verse 7. If you re Jesus said, if you remain in me, and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. And it's not a blank check. For those walking in obedience and love, when we are merged with the heart and the mind of Christ, 
we will ask according to his name and his nature. As we become close to him, as we align ourselves with him, as we become more, and I always say this, more like him and less like us, we're going to start wanting the same things he wants. We're going to start stop wanting less of what we want, and we're going to start wanting more of what he wants. And we're going to ask for that, and he's going to do it. He's going to open the gates, and he's going to pour out, because we're all going to be wanting the same thing. We're going to be more aligned with him. I could stand here today and say, oh, God, oh, God in heaven. Oh, Lord, please, today, during the service, could my Subaru become one of those brand new Corvettes? You see those things? Big old engine sits behind you now. They don't put it in front. They got it behind. It's got these big old giant gaping air scoops on the side to force the air back to the engine, like 700 horsepower. They sound unreal. We got passed by one the other day on the way home. Go figure. I'm like, hey, buddy, you want some of this? Hmm. Oh, something. Now, I could stand here and go, oh, Lord, please turn my Subaru into a new Corvette during the service today. It would bolster everyone's faith. And that everyone would believe, right? Now, in whose name and whose nature am I really asking this? In mine? Because I think I look cool in it. I at least look cooler in it than I do right now. Uh, oh, man. And, and so the answer then would be, I could hear the voice of Jesus going, why? <laughs> why? Why do you want that? Uh, how will that further my kingdom? How will that promote love to my people? And it'd be like, I could be one of those rock star megachurch pastors. Like, why? back up. How is that going to further my kingdom and further my love toward my people? And it'd be like, you can't afford the insurance anyway. I could do it. I'm not paying for your insurance though. You couldn't afford the insurance on that. You'll hurt yourself. You'll lose your license. You'll put your eye out, kid. Well, there's, there's Christmas, right? <laughs> you'll put your eye out, kid. You'll run that thing off the road. You'll wrap it around a tree. You don't need that. I can hear him saying, instead, I'm going to do a real miracle, and I'm going to make sure that thing is still what it is when you get back. I might make sure there's a couple extra door dings in it when you get back, so it's not quite as important to you as it was, you know. Uh, I'll make sure your subi is still a subi. It's, it's actually useful in serving the people. It can carry all this stuff, right? Throw the seats down, whole sound system, church, boom, in the back of a Subaru flops out. Here we are. Church goes back in, goes home. It's actually useful in serving people. It's paid for. I hear Jesus going, no, it's paid for. What do you, no, no. We're just going to leave it like it is. And, uh, you know, it's just pre-dinged, so you're not going to be all attached to it. You're not going to get all upset. Uh, I had somebody in Starbucks, like, rub some light blue paint on my bumper one time, which was really nice, you know, and I was really angry at first, and I tried to buff it out, and it won't really all come out. I'm like, well, you know, but I don't care about it as much as I used to. You know, he's trying to keep it all super nice and shiny, and that's, you know, it is what it is now. It can get places, it's reliable, it gets good gas mileage, which is really important right now. It has ground clearance, so it can get us into where we need to go. I, you know, Jesus is like, we're just going to leave that right where it's at as it is. Maybe we'll have somebody put a door ding in it while we're down here. Just that, that will be my miracle for you today. So, yeah, if I asked for that, I'd be asking in my name and my nature, not his. And so that's, that's the difference. When we begin to align ourselves with the heart and the mind of God, we ask for things that he wants. We love people like he loves people. And we want to do things like he does. We want to be his hands and feet. We want to be the conduit of his love here on this earth. That's why Jesus told his guys how to pray when he taught them to say, you know, taught them to say, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He's praying to the Father, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He didn't teach them to say, you know, this is how you do it. My will be done in heaven as it is on earth. That's not how it works. That's Cain. Remember we talked about Cain a couple weeks ago when John's like, no, love each other. Just love each other. Don't be like Cain. 
Cain was a murderous guy. He was hateful. He had something broken him. Don't be like Cain. That's, you know, that, that self-centeredness, let my will be done in heaven as it is on earth. That's a Cain thing. That's not, that's like totally opposite, diametrically opposed to what we're supposed to be. And this is his command. So, so easy. To believe in the name of Jesus and to love one another as he told us to. That's his command. So it's, it's not, you know, here's your list of, your checklist of do's and do nots, and you have to follow this. No, that's, that's not his command. It's believe in the name of Jesus and love one another as he told us to. Believe. That means to trust in, to cling to, to rely on, to, to hang everything on that name of Jesus. You know, name, names meant things in the Bible. Uh, I forget, Noah meant like repose or rest, I think. Jacob, and if your name's Jacob, you know, I'm sorry. <laughs> but Jacob meant, you know, heel-grabbing little thief. That's what it meant. It was one who usurps, one who, like, seizes the day, who grabs on and, and takes for himself. Esau means hairy. Like, like hairy bear dude, furry guy. You know, that was... So, when they were born, here comes Esau. It's like, whoa, is it a puppy? What is this thing? Oh, no, it's, you know, <laughs> it's just a hairy kid. So we're going to call him Esau. We're going to call him Harry. And then out comes, you know, Jacob was holding on to his heel right out the womb, trying to take his position in the birth order as he came out, like grabbing on, trying to take what was his. And names meant things in the Bible. Names mean things now, too. Not so much in the same way, but we come to know people by their names. Uh, friends and family, there's certain people, you know, you think of people's names. Think of your favorite people and think of their name. You know, just the, the thought of their name, the speaking of their name makes you think of them. Uh, my wife's name. Nobody can get it right for a while. And, but it's a beautiful name. I, I love her. I, I hear her name and it just makes me, it makes me giddy. It makes me old <laughs> inside. Because, you know, I adore her. I love, I love her. And all those, I hear her name and it just brings out all those, all those emotions, all those feelings and, that I have for her. Names mean things. You say the names of your children, your parents, your, your siblings, your friends. You say those and those names mean things to you. The name of Jesus literally means God is salvation. Uh, it's uh, Jehovah Shua, it's a, it's a Greek form of Jehovah Shua, which means God is our salvation. And it was in every man's name back then. Kind of like, uh, you know, somebody who's named Bill today or something, you know. There's, there's names that are very common. Hey, Sam, you know, it's, it's a very common name, but that's what it meant. But then as we get to know him, you know, it's much the same way as I get to know my wife, as I got to know my children when they grow up. And I, as I get to know them, you, you hear their name and you think, certain things of them. It brings up what you what you feel and what you think of them. And Jesus, as we get to know him, comes to mean the gold standard of love, that agape love. Outrageous love, scandalous grace. Comes to mean to me second chances, third chances, 20th chances, 100th chances. That's what he means to me. Righteousness and justice, an invitation to the table of communion with God for our entire being, our heart, our soul, our mind. The name of Jesus. So that's what it means to ask in the name of Jesus. you got to know Jesus to ask in his name. You don't just like walk in, all right, I prayed the prayer, I'm praying for my house, my money, I want this and I want that, you know, and start handing him your shopping list. He's like, wait. I don't think you really know me. I don't think you, you're not really familiar with my name. Now, I'm sure, unless you've been hiding under a rock, you know the slap that was heard around the world during the Academy Awards. I don't even watch the Academy Awards. I don't care about the Academy Awards. I don't care about the Grammys. I don't care about the Emmys. I, I watch what I want. I don't need their approval to tell me what I watch and listen to is good, right? I, I try not to watch it. We did not watch, but I could not ignore it the next day. Pulled up. You know, first thing I do is uh, I'll bring up a couple news sites and, you know, BBC all the way over the pond. Here's a picture of, you know, of Will Smith, like, you know, in full regalia of swing. The thing about that, whether you, uh, you love it, hate it, I mean, the media grabbed onto it. They love salacious stuff like that. But the thing that, 
that struck me when I went back and watched that clip was Will Smith is sitting there. I won't say the expletives because he threw a couple in. Take my wife's name out of your mouth. I thought that was interesting because his wife's name means something to him. And he thought it was being abused and dragged through the mud up on that stage. Whether he should have got up and slapped, uh, slapped it or not, I don't know. That's, that's, you know. that's between them. But I thought that was interesting that, you know, take my name out of your mouth. And I wonder if there are times in my life where God's like, take my son's name out of your mouth. I don't want to be that. So names mean things. What does the name of Jesus mean to you? And I guess that's you know, where, where we're going to kind of head today with this. What does the name of Jesus mean to you? What does it mean to me? This so might be a good time to think about that. Think about what the name of Jesus means to you and to make sure it lines up with the reality of who he actually is. There's all kinds of opinions about Jesus. We tried last night to watch a documentary. You know, and the documentary started hitting all over the place about, you know, oh, mysteries of the Bible. Jesus, and we start watching, and man, they don't know. They don't know him. They don't know his name. They don't know his character. And, uh, you know, like, well, science says that this could have happened. And I'm like, that, that's all well and good. You know, I'm open to science having a part in it. If they're open to God having a part in science, you know, can we just keep our minds open here? Uh, but they don't know. There's all these opinions about who Jesus is. But you got to know him. You got to know him to know him. You got to know him to partake in his name. You got to know him to partake in his nature. So the command is trust in, cling to, and rely on the nature of the character of Jesus. Love one another like he told us to. The one who keeps God's commands lives and abides in him, and he in them. We know that he lives and abides in us because the spirit he gave us, gave us lives and abides in us. Romans chapter 8, which is a good companion uh, passage to what we're doing here. Romans 8, 14 through 17 says, For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. It doesn't say they have to feel like the children of God. They are the children of God. Those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you received does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father, which is two different words for father. Abba is very intimate. You know, anybody can be a father. Not everybody can be a dad. You might have heard that, you know, and you got to have both. And, you know, it kind of brings both those into, into the picture. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. So as we wrap up this chapter, as we wrap up today, uh, John has given us a lot in this chapter about abiding, about love, about abiding, love one another, love one another, abide, love, abide, a lot about that. How great is the Father, or the love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called the children of God. He starts the whole chapter out with that. How great. It's like, what in the world, right? That's what that literally means. What in the world love that he has lavished on us that we should be called the children of God? We should act like his children if we're his children. We are called more than, than sin and living under the thumb of the accuser. And man, he loves that. But if he gets you over a barrel, he tempt you to do something you didn't want to do. Point the finger and just like, that's who you are. No, that's not what we're meant to be. We're called to so much more. We're called to be free. We are called to root into Jesus and to be conduits of his love. To grow, to bloom, to, ex- to put on fruit, to extend fruit over the fence. Remember we talked about that a couple weeks ago, how a fruit tree will sometimes grow and spread out and it extends fruit over the property line. And that's what we're supposed to do. We grow, we bloom, we, we put on fruit, we extend that fruit out over the property line to those around us. That's the freedom we're called to. Don't be bowel obstructed to people. Remember that one? Where it's like, if you, have, if you can do good, if you have something that you can 
bring life to somebody, something life-sustaining, whether it's your, your finances, your skills, a kind, loving word. If you have something that will bring life to people and you don't, it says you're obstructed. That's what the Greek said, and that's like from the guts. You're like bowel obstructed with your love. Don't be like that. Do believe in the character of Jesus and love people. And God will overrule our own hearts and feelings when they're wrong. You know, I don't know where all of y'all are at today, but sometimes we're haunted by the times that we haven't done right, the times we haven't loved people as we should, the times we haven't loved people like Jesus has shown us how to love. How do we deal with a guilty conscience when our heart feels unlovely, when our heart condemns us? Not by ignoring it and just pretending this stuff didn't happen, uh, but instead by turning it toward God. Take it to God, setting our own hearts and minds on who he is and how he loves us and taking that, those, you know, I think everybody's got those parts of their lives they're really not proud of, they don't like to tell. And if you got that, bring it to God, tell it to God. Bring it and put it down and watch what he's able to do with that. He's like, wow, you really broke this up pretty good. Let's put it on the workbench, see what we can do with it. I think we can polish that up and turn it into something good, you know. It's, this is what it is, but I think we can use that to make something else, you know. So let's use that story to make something different, you know. Bring it to God. Romans 8.1, the companion chapter again, says, Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. How much condemnation? None. Amen. That's good news. So I think at some point you have to let yourself emerge from the shadow. A lot of us have those parts in our lives where we just can't quite get past, can't let go of. I think at some point you have to emerge from the shadow of what you were and live where you are. And this is ongoing. Because there are times out and about I'm like, man, I wish I would have done that differently. And it's like, bring it to God. Tell it to God. 